I was told it always rains in, uh, in Scotland. Uh, I'm not Scottish, yeah, so, but I'm familiar with this uh, climatological uh, circumstances. I'm a Belgian, and as Simon told, I'm, uh, I worked at academia um, in uh, Paralympic sport. In, uh, have been counseling Belgian athletes for since the uh, end of the 80s, uh, all the way through 2006, when I w got a call that there was an empty office in Bonn, and I uh, considered uh, taking that position. Ended up being the medical and scientific director. Um, I'm dealing with the medical services across the movement, with the games being the highlight. So I'm in charge of making sure an organizing committee puts in place the right service level for Paralympic athletes. And the statement is quite easy. If it works for the Paralympics, it works for the Olympics. It doesn't necessarily work the other way around. That's why they put the Olympics ahead of us. It's a good test event. <laughs> yeah? So I deal also with the anti-doping program. Not going to expand on that one. Uh, and then I have classification portfolio and the sports science portfolio. Um, I was given a very broad team, the para-athlete, or the Paralympic athlete is the term we used to uh, work with, but Paralympic refers to those who uh, were Paralympians and or participate in a Paralympic sport. Movement is growing, that's why we adopt the term para-athlete, and I hope you can find yourself in that terminology, so welcome. Um, so obviously when you say the para-athlete, I can speak for a few annual programs on that one. Uh, which I'm not going to do. So I needed to make a little bit of choices. So I'm going to guide you through what the movement is, what the Paralympic movement is, where we are today, and what our ambition is, and then highlight two areas that build into the invitation I got extended to join for meetings tomorrow to discuss some of the research. And that will be classification, obviously, and then um, where are we with coordination impairments and CP profiles and traumatic brain injury. So that would guide us for the next 30, 35, 40 minutes. And then the more I talk, the fewer questions you have afterwards. So that's the nice thing about it. Um, but rather than uh, me giving, um, talking too much on these things, I would like to take off with a video. That's a video that we uh, made for our 20th anniversary, which is now six years ago. But it gives you an overview on the growth of the movement and it gives you a snapshot of all the sports that we have in the Paralympic movement. I'm going to show these sports afterwards on a slide. Usually when I'm doing this with... Uh, officials in training or with classifiers or with groups of students, you take pen and paper and you start noting and writing down all the sports and we don't go to the next slide until I get the full list. I'm not going to do this with you. Yeah? But try to identify 20 summer sports and 5 winter sports. And since then there's a few more. So let's see how far you can get with your uh, tick box. Yeah?
But above all, when we come together, we will be part of the creation of an almost touchable and definitely breathable distinctive energy source, which is at the heart of the Paralympic movement. And it's what we call the Paralympic spirit. You will see that we are all people of one world. So America. You can get to see the best in people in the Paralympics. You get to see the possibilities for people with disabilities. We don't think about disability, we think about sport. I like it. So it's all about what courage you have to do all this. Life is a marathon because it's up and down. And I always say that I lost my sight, but I never lost my vision. Athletes with disabilities overcome challenge each and every day, but in a very real and visual, physical way that other people can find inspiration and motivation. We can maximize our, our ability, and that's um, you know that, that's not specific to the disabled world, and 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 I don't want the world to be seen as separate. started. Paralympic athletes are a force in the world for change. Their spirit in motion continues beyond the finishing line. So that others can follow in their footsteps, encountering fewer obstacles and experiencing their life-fulfilling potential. How far did you count? 24? <laughs> 22. <laughs> okay, we'll come back to that one. It was alluded to in the video, the origin, uh, the birthplace, if you put it that way, of the Paralympic movement is 1944. That's when Sir Ludwig Goodwin, who's a German Jewish uh, orthopedic surgeon, left Germany, went to Stoke Mandeville, and became the director of the rehab center there. And he introduced sport as an entire and an integral part of the rehab scheme. And in 1948, when London uh, hosted the Olympic Games, at the day of the opening ceremony, he organized the first tournament in the garden of the rehab center. And that is uh, now officially recognized as the birthday of the Paralympic movement. It was a tournament with two teams of archers, 16 players in total. 1952, he went international with that event. He did it on an annual basis. Every time when there was the opening remembrance of the opening ceremony, he had his tournament in the garden and then he went international. 1960 is then when we had the first Paralympic Games in Rome. And from there, the journey took off and in 1976, we complemented our, our uh, games with the Winter Games. And I'm only taking here a few snapshots of the history uh, to avoid that this becomes a full history class. Um, 1980 is one word mentioning to you, again, in light of the theme of my visit here. This is when athletes with coordination impairment CP profiles got introduced to the Paralympic Games. That was in Arnhem at that moment in time. Before that, it was only spinal cord injury, 
and then amputee and what we call les autres, and I'll come back to that one, they got introduced before that time. CPs followed, and then afterwards the blind followed too, and then in the latest group was intellectual impairment in uh, 1996. Bear with me, 1982 is the first moment that the different organizations started to collaborate. We had uh, IPSA, International Blind Sport Organization. We had CP ISRA, Cerebral Palsy International Support and Recreation Association. We had IWAS, International Wheelchair and Amputee Sport Federation. And we have INAS, INAS FIT in that time for intellectual impairment. These were the four, and before I was, you had IZOT, International Sport for Organization for the Disabled, mainly amputation, and then ISMWSF, International Stoke Mandeville Wheelchair Sport Federation. Stoke Mandeville, the name comes back in the title of the federation. These were the founding fathers of the Paralympic movement, and each of them stood for one impairment type. You had the spinal, the Stoke Mandeville wheelchair sport, spinal cord injury, amputees, intellectual impairment, the blind and visual impaired, CP profiles, and then CIS, which is the deaf and hearing impaired. They were all little umbrellas. They, they did their own thing. They had their own events. And each of them, in one way or another, was seeking for kind of a, a relationship with the Olympic Committee because that was, that's where you had the games and they had the facilities. That was everybody's interest was to, to try to, to become part of the Olympic movement. And the IOC said, well, strategically, we, will, what we want you to get one organization that speaks on your behalf and which will be kind of our relational partner. So 1982, it was called the International Coordination Center. And this was an umbrella organization with representatives of all these different um, international organizations. And they started to formally negotiate on behalf of the Paralympic athlete with the IOC. And it resulted into an agreement that from Seoul onwards, the Paralympic Games were organized back to back in the Olympic Games in the same venue using the same facilities. 1982. In 1989, this was then formalized into the International Paralympic Committee. That's the birthday of the organization as it currently stands. Um, the same organizations are in there. A certain moment in time, the deaf in the course of the 90s decided that they couldn't keep or they felt uncomfortable with their identity within this group of diverse impairment types and they decided to um, get out of the organization again and today they're still a separate organization and they organize the Deaf Olympics and that is also why we don't have deaf and hearing impaired individuals within the Paralympic movement unless it's a, an associated condition to any other uh, impairment type. The main driver for that one was the partnership with the International Olympic Committee, uh, which then resulted in 2000 in formal agreements about uh, marketing rights, about broadcasting rights, about hosting rights. And since then, there have been a few versions of this agreement. We continue to renew it regularly, and it sets more or less the conditions, the growth um, of the Paralympic Games. The IOC has no jurisdiction on the movement. We are not a member. The IOC is not a member structure. They have a membership in terms of Olympic Games. But we are a very strong partner to them. And that means when now they reach out to bid cities and candidates for the Olympic Games, it is a host city requirement to also accommodate the Paralympic Games. There is budget, there is jurisdiction, there's an agreement on the number of sports, the number of athletes, the number of medals. Yeah? And we hope that little by little we can increase that number and we will see how far that brings. But the partnership is, is a really, really nice one. Just a few numbers in growth. Rome 1960 were the first Paralympic Games, London 2012 
we went from 400 athletes to 4,237. Rio, 4,250, because that's the quorum that we have agreed upon with the IOC. We don't want one more. We don't want one less. Yeah, we just want to have that number. We went from 23 countries to 164. Rio target is 170. Yeah, so that's what we aim for. We went from eight sports to 20 sports. And then the number of tickets and the audience, TV audience, that we, that we reach out with with the movement. And you see the same dynamic from Orskovic in Sweden to Sochi um, last year from 53 athletes to 540, which is still a very, very small event if you see uh, what we cater for. Next month we have the World Championships IPC Athletics. We have 1,600 athletes and the World Championships. So um, the Winter Games is definitely not our biggest event, but of course it's a very important one. We have 45 countries. That number will be difficult to, to raise because obviously you need access to snow and ice uh, in order to build a winter sports program. We had five sports in Sochi. We will have six in Pyeongchang in 2018. Snowboard was introduced in Sochi, but as a discipline of alpine skiing, in the next edition it will become a standalone sport, which allows us also to grow on that program. And again, you see how much uh, we can activate uh, since uh, we started from there. That was my history. You can have much more of that one. And for those who have an interest, you go on our, and I can leave my presentation with you so that you can share it afterwards. Um, there's a link on our website that gives you a very nice video that walks you through the history in, in a much better way than I can do it. Uh, in, in these five minutes that I uh, spent on it. Who are the sports and how is the organization structured? We have four categories of, um, of um, ownership of sports governance. This is the historical one. It's with the IOSDs. This is where we have the uh, original impairment-driven organizations, like CP ISRA, like IPSA, like INAS and IWAS. So IWAS today is still the governing body for wheelchair fencing. IPSA, International Blind Sports, is football five, goalball judo. CP ISRA today has no sports on the Paralympics program under their governance. The both sports they had four years ago, boccia and football seven, they went independent. Yeah, they went here into becoming an independent Paralympic only um, international sports organization. And INAS is, in, is the international organization for intellectual impairment sports. They don't have a sport under their own jurisdiction, but the ID athletes, they are in athletics, swimming, and table tennis for the moment in the Paralympic Games program. They run more events. They have cycling, they have judo, they have basketball, just to name a few. Um, but in games mode, it's only in three Paralympic sports. Then we have what we ultimately try to achieve is the integration of Paralympic sports in the Olympic federations, which also is um, a prerequisite for the, for the Paralympic Games. A sport only can become a Paralympic sport if it is governed by an Olympic sport organization. That means if it does have an Olympic counterpart, an able-bodied counterpart, or when it is Paralympic specific. So when there is no Olympic equivalent. So we have inclusion of archery. So the para-archery athletes, they are within the World Archery Organization. The cyclists are with the UCI. The rowing people, the rowing athletes are with FISA. So they are integrated. And that usually means they have a department which is called para-cycling or para-rowing or wheelchair tennis, which belongs to ITF, International Tennis Federation. Then you have a few sports that decided to set up a totally independent structure, usually with a very good partnership with the Olympic equivalent. Boccia is a CP sport, traumatic brain injury and coordination impairment, does not have an Olympic uh, equivalent, used to sit with CP ISRA, now is BISFET, it's its own international Boccia International Sports Federation, 
Football 7, similarly, they are now the International Federation for CP Football. Sitting Volleyball is World Para Volley. And then we have uh, International Wheelchair Basketball Federation and International Wheelchair Rugby Federation. And again, at least those three, they have a very good partnership uh, with the Olympic equivalent, which allows us to um, benefit, for instance, in my area, on anti-doping services. They work together on TUE management, on sample collections, on procedures, result management. So that's, that's, that's an example of, of um, collaboration. Football 7 is talking to UEFA and FIFA uh, to see if a partnership can be set up over time. Um, not sure with FIFA whether it's the right timing for the moment being, but we'll see. And then we still have a group of sports which today belong to the IPC, um, the, the Paralympic Movement, um, uh, where we also act as the International Federation. That's uh, Alpine, that's athletics, uh, powerlifting, shooting and swimming in summer, and that's alpine skiing, biathlon, cross country, sledge hockey and snowboard in our winter sports program. And then for historical reasons, we also have wheelchair dance sport, but it's not on the games program. It might become over time, but we have it. It's not on winter or summer games. The aim is that this column here over time gets empty so that the Paralympic movement does not have to cater for sports as an international federation. So this group either will go Paralympic specific, either integrated. But we will not do that overly hasty. That needs to be, if you marry, you need to be two. Yeah? And uh, that's what we need to look for. You also see the complexity. If we have an athletics competition, 1,600 athletes in a world championships, we have about, I think, 250 medal events. It's quite difficult to integrate that in the IWF world championships. So then, how is integration going to work? The same with swimming. We had close to 700 athletes in Glasgow uh, in ju last July for the World Championships. Integration is quite complex. Yeah? It might work easier for shooting, and the dialogue is ongoing. There's a very good dialogue with uh, alpine skiing and FIS because we use the same officials. We need the same uh, snow, and we need to... That, so every sport has its own dynamic, but don't put me on a timeline when that um, transfer is going to happen. There's a few color schemes here. Um, we have two new sports in Rio, canoe and triathlon. They make their debut in uh, Rio in 2016, next year. And then we uh, regretfully lose sailing and football seven in Tokyo. And we will have two newcomers, which is badminton and taekwondo. And there's a lot of debate of that one. So what happens after every games is that every federation is um, asked to, there's a review taking place. Whether you have a good governance structure, whether your finances are solid, whether your development is grow, uh, whether you, your growth of your sport is secured, whether your classification system is up to date, your anti-doping program. So there's a whole checklist of items and regretfully football seven and sailing uh, did not meet the criteria and uh, that's why they they uh, were voted out by the governing board uh, from the tokyo program again we have a limit only 22 sports on the program so some get out and others came in and this program will repeat itself after every games both winter and summer so that uh, also prompts everybody to be active and continue growing. It's quite amazing that a sport like Football 7 um, mainly failed to reach out worldwide. They had less than 20 countries participating in worldwide CP football. And, um, well, there's room for growth there. There's, uh, football is a sport that's not asking for too much and quite popular across the world. This is our new strategic plan, and it, it has a date frame. It's a four-year date frame, but it builds on the previous one, and it's unlikely to change fundamentally afterwards. We have a vision that is to enable para-athletes to achieve sporting excellence and inspire and excite the world. That, that's our vision. That's what we stand for in our daily work and our daily activity. However, 
With this strategic plan, we build an aspiration on that one, and that is that we do this to make for a more inclusive uh, a society for people with an impairment through sport. And that's why when we go to cities for the games, we drive very much on an accessibility agenda and a social legacy agenda. What does this game mean in terms of uh, changing something for your citizens? We don't want to be your 30-day visitor at the games and you making a lot of investment only for that 30-day uh, period that we are your guests. We want uh, you to take something out of it. London did a wonderful job in that one. Sochi did a wonderful job. We are very confident that uh, Rio can do something similar. And we do this by the values that our athletes stand for, which is courage, determination, inspiration, and equality. And again, I could speak for some time on that one, but each of our athletes are unique assets by courage, by determination, but they are inspiring role models and they, in their own behalf, also try to make the difference. And that's uh, what uh, translates in, in our daily work. And I got involved as a volunteer in uh, some, some time in the 80s last year, and I'm still around. Um, I never had the ambition of working with Olympic athletes because these guys are something unique. And uh, it attracted me in one way or another, and, well, it, kept, it keeps me attracting. And I hope it, uh, it applies to many of you. The way we do this, uh, we try to achieve this vision and aspiration is by our goals. They are threefold. First is to consolidate the Paralympic Games as the primary event that we have in the movement, both winter and summer. Is to uh, ensure growth of the alum uh, athletes and empower our athletes to have more grassroots uh, participation. We try to reach out much more to um, local and recreational sport than we used to do before. So our target should not only be the elite athlete and then recognize the brand, the Agitos, uh, um, which is our logo that you can see here, should over term hopefully become equally popular and equally recognized as the Olympic rings. Uh, good luck with that one. Yeah. Um, but um, the way we do it is mainly to um, try to get sustainable folding. Um, in no way you can make a comparison about the financial means of the IOC and the IPC. I think what we do on an annual basis is pocket money for the other organization. Our annual budget is 10 million euros. And that's it. And our revenues, 80% are coming from the um, games organizers through marketing and broadcasting rights. So that's just to put things into the right perspective. We um, are significantly driven by volunteer engagement. We have a 75-person staff in Bonn, uh, which I will come back to you. There is obviously uh, professionals in different sport organizations, particularly when these are integrated sports federations. But if you take away all the officials, classifiers, and volunteers in committees and in structures, you will definitely um, uh, hamper the development of, uh, of the Paralympic movement. I think that counts for, the para for, for sports in general. It is exclusively driven or must exclusively driven by volunteers. But what we then do is we try to organize. We have our own academy. It's called the IPC Academy. That's our educational spin-off. It's a partnership with the World Academy of Sport, which is based in Manchester. And uh, we organize tailored um, training programs for athletes, athlete career transition, in order for athletes to step up and take administrative tasks within the movement. We run uh, our classified training, for instance, through the academy with certain formats. We run our officials training. We now recently set up a coaching training program in IPC Athletics. And we have observers programs for games organizers. That means when we organize the games, there is a candidate hosts and future hosts that come to a school program, a learning program that runs in the back of the house, which allows them to then start getting familiar with all the different things that make up a big organization, from transportation over ticketing, over venues, infrastructure, village, name it, and there is a parallel program in place. And obviously, we cannot do this thing on our own. We don't pretend to do that. 
We seek for strategic partnerships, the IOC being our main one. That's our most important partner that we work with. But we also have a great partnership with the UN. We are working with UNESCO, we're working with UNICEF, mainly to drive our uh, development agenda and our legacy agenda. And then in my area, when we talk medical and science, I have partnerships with ACSM, the American College of Sport Medicine. I have a partnership with FIMS, which is the International Sport Medicine Federation, which allows me to integrate Paralympic symposia and Paralympic science within, within their structures and within their networking, and in turn gives me access to a pool of experts that we can then try to bring to our agenda. And uh, to, to, at this very moment, it, it turns out to be very, very useful and partnerships in, in both directions, by the way. The way we are organized is that we have a general assembly that is meeting every two years. The next one is in two months in November in um, Mexico. And it is made up by the sports. So every sport that we have on the program is effectively a member. And they have a voting right in our organization. We have the National Paralympic Committees. We have the IOSDs, which were the FAR funding members. I was IPSA, INES, and CP ISRA. And we have our regional organizations. And they all have equally one vote per organization. In total, that comes up to about 220 votes. They meet every two years, and they are responsible to elect the governing board. So we have an election for president every four years, election for vice president every four years, and then an election for 10 governing board members. So in a, in a worst case scenario, every four year, we may, have, we may have a full makeover of the governance structure, uh, fortunately, it doesn't go that way. Yeah, but you see some changes. And for the moment, the organization is led by Sir Philip Craven. Uh, he's in his last term. So 2017 is uh, quite an important year for the movement because we know for sure that we will have a new president. Yeah, and that's going to be the first. Well, Sir Philip is the um, second president. Uh, before him, we had uh, Bob Stedwood as a Canadian. He was leading the organization from 89 till 2001. So Philip took over 2001. We are now going into 2017. So we are up for our third president um, in, in, in about two years from now. We have standing committees and councils that advise the governing board. We have an athlete council. We have a sports council, a region council and an IOSD council, so the, um, the funding members, they still have a, a voice and an advisory role to the governing board. And equally, we have a series of standing committees that advise the governing board on certain aspects. <coughs> we have a development committee, we have a women in sport committee, we have a finance and audit committee, we have a legal committee, and in my area, we have a classification committee, anti-doping committee, medical committee, and a sports science committee. And there's a few more. And they, in turn, advise the governing boards on, on daily matter policies and procedures. That translates into a management team um, that is in Bonn, where I'm located. This is our main building. We grew a little bit, so we have two buildings. So we use a, 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 an office floor in a, in a separate building as well. Um, this is our location. The neighbor on this side of the street is the residence of the German president when he's in Bonn and uh, ch uh, the chancellor. So we're in good company over there. We're very well protected. Um, this is our White House. Yeah? <laughs> 75 staff member and they serve the movement across these different sports, but also um, for the IPC sports. And in these IPC sports, athletics, swimming, we have sport technical committees, that is, sport technical advisory committees in athletics, in swimming, that uh, act to, to bring in expertise uh, for rules, for uh, competition formats, uh, for equipment, and, and that kind of things. So that's where we are. We are located. Um, Bonn is quite um, an interesting place to be there. It became kind of a sleeping government city when the government moved out. It was the capital of uh, West Germany. And then when Germany reunited, it all went to Berlin. And that's why Bonn went out 
to seek international organizations. Some people will find it boring. I find it interesting. It has a nice climate. It's a little bit like Edinburgh. Uh, and it has uh, a nice scenery outside. There's also what we would call, uh, I'm a lowlander, I would call it a, a mountain. Yeah? And the Germans would call it a little hill. Yeah? So, but it's, it's a nice place to be. We could have been in Kuala Lumpur or Colorado Springs. Uh, sorry, sorry. This is quite an important one um, that I, I, I guide you through. The Paralympic movement is not offering sport facilities for all different impairment types. <coughs> and uh, even today I got emails from athletes who were ruled non-eligible. And they wonder, but, but hey, I, I cannot make it to the Olympic team, so, so I must be given access to the Paralympic Games. Um, we are quite an exclusive organization. For historical reasons, we only cater for 10 different impairment types. And this is the old terminology, spinal cord injuries, and then you had amputee and les autres. You had the cerebral palsy, traumatic brain injury, les autres, visual impairment, and intellectual impairment. This is the terminology we used to work with. Now we aligned our terminology, and I'll come back to that one in a minute with the wording of the World Health Organization. So we are talking about impaired muscle power, limb deficiency, leg length difference. This list is a list that has been built historically. It has been compiled on who all the sports in the movement had as their constituency. And now you will see the deaf are not there because the deaf are not part of the organization. They can apply. And then they need to seek for an application through the governing board and the General Assembly, and then eventually they can be added. But we are quite exclusive on that one. That means we don't cater for diabetes. We don't cater for um, heart transplants. We don't cater for kidney transplants. We don't cater for X, Y, and Z. So there is quite a lot of impairments that are not covered by the organization. And I get daily questions on how come and how come this is unfair and this is injustice and all kinds of arguments are brought into the equation. But it's, it's important to recognize that one. But they are something unique. And again, I could speak for quite some time about these athletes and these athlete populations. So I'm gonna, uh, I'm gonna be short and really deal with only a few components. One of them being classification, because that makes us unique, and the other one, coordination impairment, because that's what brought me to Edinburgh at this moment in time. When we talk about classification, you will clearly see when you see this competition format that there might be something unfair with that. Yeah? What's unfair? Look like a classroom here. Eh? All of a sudden, everybody's silent on really. The size is it's one argument. Yeah, weight. Yeah, age and uh, power, and then gender is another one. Yeah. So to a certain extent, um, classification is is no different. It's a structure of competition to ensure that in the end of the day, the one who wins is the one that has trained the best has access to the best means, the best tools, but has not a disadvantage by nature of him impairment that makes him challenged or unfair against someone else. And obviously it would take quite a little bit of my time to get you into the detail of classification across all the sports, um, but there's some principles behind it. It's important to know that when we, all, when we started in 48 with these games, we had a medical classification system. We were a spinal cord injury organization, and you were categorized in A, B, C, D, spinal cord injury, and that was the classes you competed in. And the first system that got introduced was in wheelchair basketball, when they said, look, if all these spinal cords are competing together, it's going to be unfair. We're going to have one lesion level, A and B, which is the second lesion level. And then from there, tick, 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 it differentiated. Now, as the clinic and the rehab center started to grow, they built a second floor on top of it. That was now the amputee floor. 
So because you were on a different floor, now you had different classes. So again, A, B, C, D. And then the CP floor was built on top. CP was different than amputees and spinal cord injuries. That means you had another A, B, C, D. And you see what happens when you now build on a visual floor and you build on an intellectual department. Yeah? Became non-sustainable. The system was too big. And in the end of the 80s, and the driver were the games in Barcelona, the movement underwent also a philosophic reasoning. We were not a disability organization. We wanted to be a sports organization. And it was about ability and not about disability. And if you put an amputee in a wheelchair to race, or you put a guy in a wheelchair who has legs but can't use them, the mode of propulsion is your upper body. That means if you both have arm strength, what prohibits you from competing together? So that's how these systems got merged into each other, and it was done to the best knowledge available. And we call it a functional classification system. <coughs> Every sport was looking into how can we bring the number of classes down by seeing who has equal means of propulsion, equal means of shooting, equal means of throwing, equal means of, and they looked at it by sport. This was driven by Barcelona as the games organizers. They went to Korea in 1988 to Seoul and they saw many, many medal events with few athletes per event because there were so many classes. And they said, first of all, we are not Asia. We are not able to do this. Secondly, we don't think it's a good idea to have all these different split classes with no athletes. How can it give value for the money? How can this give credibility for what these athletes stand for? You will need to cut the number of classes. So all the sports got about four years' time between 88 and 92 to make the shift. Again, no data, no science behind it. Science for Paralympic sports was non-existing. And make it happen. So they had smart people sitting together and tried to bring it together. Then we go to 2000, Sydney, which is somewhere here. And um, the system now, all of a sudden, we have media interest for Paralympic sports. We have marketing interest. We have athletes with managers. We have athletes bringing lawyers to complain. And the first thing they complain about was classification because the system was unfair. I compete against this one, sorry to point at you, eh, but he's better than I am. We can, he's, in, he's in the wrong class. <coughs> you were never in the wrong class. It was always the other one. The other one was in the wrong class. And they started to debate that with the classifiers, and the classifiers said, hey, it's my call. Yeah? And then they said, you play that way, I'll bring in a lawyer. They brought in lawyers. And they had a different reading of the rules and the procedures. And while everybody worked with a set of rules that was quite good in agreement upon, obviously, when you bring in another category, and particularly lawyers, they read things slightly different. Any lawyers here? <laughs> OK. Should have asked that before, no? Uh, so they, they start giving their different interpretation. And we saw that we, did, we had to conduct an analysis on what was the strength and the weaknesses of classification system. And we found out, amongst others, that there was no definition. There was no definition of classification. Everybody has his own definition a little bit. So it came together in 2007 by means of the classification code. A little bit like the World Anti-Doping Code. One governing umbrella document that tells us what needs to be done, and how the movement, how classification in the movement is going to be conducted. It had a definition, and it told you a little bit how the process needs to be undertaken, and it was complemented by international standards, which were technical procedures on athlete assessment, protest and appeals, classifier training, all the things that were revealed in this strategy as subject for improvement. And now we have worked with this document for, uh, for some time, and now we are up to the revision. The revision uh, process has just been finalized, and if all goes well, we will have a new uh, classification code adopted in November in the end of this year. 
The key on that one is that classification needs to be sport-specific and evidence-based. What does that mean? First of all, what's the process of classification? If you take a continuum of me, and I consider myself now healthy and not impaired, to someone that really has significant challenges by means of amputation, illness, trauma, congenital, but there is an anatomical dysfunction somewhere. First call is that you need to look, is there an impairment? You need to prove this by means of diagnostical information. Secondly, which impairment? Out of all the sports, not all the sports cater for all the impairment types. Some sports have been exclusively for visual impairment. Other sports have been exclusively for coordination impairment. Athletics has been catering for all 10 of the impairment types. So, is there an impairment? Can we prove it with the necessary diagnostic information? All are not complemented with imaging. And what's the severity? The impairment must have kind of a threshold to consider this having an impact on the activity. I'm rather clumsy. I'm happy to have an office job. So if I now chop my finger off, gardening on Saturday, chop off my finger, am I impaired? Yes, because I lost a part, a, sec a segment of a limb. What's my impact? What does this mean now in terms of me being the medical and scientific director of the Paralympic movement? Office job, traveling around, talking to people, meeting. Perhaps my typing skills on my computer might be altered a little bit, but the impact is minimal. So I would have an impairment, but it doesn't qualify me for the job I'm doing. What if I were a professional piano player? I need to reorient my career. In this relationship, I do have an impairment. It significantly impacts. So now I fall on this side. If I'm even more clumsy and I chop off now my... I'll imagine I lost my hand, my full hand. And I'm a runner. What is the impact of losing this hand on running? Not too much. We even have studies done in able-bodied when you simulate what happens when the arm is locked against the body, when it's hidden, it's there when you can't freely move it. One percent? It does have an impact. It can still be the difference between gold and silver. But it's not what we call significant. So therefore, an athlete with a unilateral arm amputation below the elbow is not eligible in long distance running in the Paralympic movement. He can seek inclusion with the Olympic uh, organization. In sprinting, we allow them because for sprinting, the whole propulsion, we don't know exactly what it means, but coming from the crutch start, it may, it may alter a little bit, and that's where we consider that <coughs> a significant impact. But if that same athlete now goes into the sport of swimming, the picture is slightly different because he loses a part of a limb with a lot of propulsion. So losing that hand makes you eligible for swimming. That's the concept behind classification. So now you can make a more complex example. And again, I'm not going to go do that. So what you end up is what, with this in mind, you are either in or out. And then you end up with what we call a very large group and most likely you will need to subdivide that in different classes. And that is where it all becomes now a little bit tricky because why is this line here and not here? And again, that's the lawyers coming to me. And that's where we try to have research data now in support that tell us something about that relationship between the impairment and the activity. And the purpose of my visit here in Edinburgh is that tomorrow, amongst others, we will talk about 
this equation, this relationship in terms of race running, which is a discipline to be explored in the sport of athletics. This is another way of presenting it. This is the World Health Organization taxonomy. It has a unique definition of impairment, which is the loss of body function or loss of body structure. And again, there are only 10 that we recognize within the Paralympic movement. And you need to show us the proof by means of medical diagnostic information. And then your activity is the sport discipline you're doing. And again, running has other demands than throwing. And sailing has other demands than swimming. So again, we look at the relationship between this activity and that impairment. And very careful with that, it is about the quality of that activity, not the outcome of the, of the activity, not the performance time. Because I can tactically run a 1500 meter very, very, very slowly. The goal is to qualify. So if I would take the race time as my activity parameter in this equation, I'm compromising the one that train hard and the one that are lazy take advantage of it. So I need to go with criteria that are not bound, not influenced by training. So which are intrinsic to the nature of the impairment. That hand function, yeah, of the loss of my finger. And that's where there's a lot of work on the table. And that's why if you take our CP athlete, the criteria of going downhill over 100 kilometers an hour are slightly different than running a 1500 meter. And that's what we need to explore. What is that relationship? Which are the core determinants? <clears throat> In order to be a 1500 meter runner, what do I need to know? What do I need to do? I need to have a, a, a certain start regimen at a certain pace. I need to be able to run the curbs and I need to be able in the end to accelerate in the, in the, in the straight line. If I'm a skier, <clears throat> I need to find that ideal line yeah, going downhill without losing too much speed. How do we quantify these measures? That's what we try to resolve in a classification equation. Looking at the CP classification, it usually it's organized with four classes in ambulant or standing, and then you have wheelchair users in the more severe type. I'm not going to expand on this in, in terms of time, but this is an, uh, a classification system. So if you look at football seven, you will have athletes in one, two, three, four categories playing football. If you look at athletics for the moment being, you have a system that has eight classes built up a little bit in this same format. Why CP classes and coordination impairment? One of the big complexities here we have is we don't have good measurement tools as of today that are sport specific. A lot of the work we are doing is based on tests that come out of rehab and physiotherapy. And that's where there's some work on the desk. And I'm going to guide you through some of that work for the remaining minutes. If you want to know more about classification, um, again, our website is hopefully a helpful entry resource for you. You go to paralympic.org and then slash classification. And then from there, you can navigate through different pages. And again, if you need any questions, if you use that email, it, can, it comes to me. So I have to answer it for you anyway. Um, coordination impairment. That's what I want to focus on in the last part. We are talking here about athletes that either have hypertonia, an abnormal increase of muscle tension, and a reduced ability to stretch the muscles. We have ataxia, which is the lack of coordination, or we have atetosis when there is unbalanced and involuntary movements. These are quite medical terms. We know that. The good thing about it is they are quite well described. The complexity is they manifest themselves clinically in every individual differently. It is hardly impossible to find two CP athletes with the same clinical manifestation. As a former academic, that's quite exciting. As a sports governing body manager, it's a little bit nightmare, <laughs> yeah? Because you can't do it right, yeah? 
But that's okay. I'm good hands tomorrow, so we can we can make make some progress hopefully. If you look at where these athletes are across sports, they are all over the place. <coughs> athletes with coordination impairments today can enter a Paralympic sport at choice with the exclusion of judo, goalball, football five, sitting volleyball and canoe. These sports have made a decision not to open for um, coordination impairment athletes. These three, because they are exclusively for visual impairment, these are mainly uh, athletes with amputation, and canoe will likely go there over time, but since it's a new sport that had to develop a totally new classification system, they uh, waited with introducing uh, coordination impairment until they got a grasp on the other uh, impairment types. So it's, uh, for them it's a matter of time. And then you have two sports that are quite exclusive to athletes with coordination impairments, that is boccia and football seven. What I did in preparation to this talk is um, I went, and I certainly will not say that I did a, uh, a systematic review, uh, but I went a little bit into the literature. What is, what is out there on, on athletes with cerebral palsy? And you know what? It's not that much. Hardly to say anything. Because everything you find in CP athletes and sport <coughs> is all coming from a rehab environment. And it's mainly driven by physiotherapy uh, research. And that obviously has very good value. I'm the first one to admit that. I'm a physio. Uh, although my wife would uh, claim the opposite. Uh, but there's good value, but it does not necessarily translate into what, to what extent that also applies to a well-trained athlete. So what I did is I, I obviously attend some conferences and I, and I give credit to people that gave me some of their slides and I just want to show you five, six of these what I call work in progress. And this one for me was an eye opener. Nick Diaper might be known to you um, for some. He is in the uh, English Institute of Sport at this very moment as a Paralympic uh, liaison contact person and he used to be coaching uh, boccia players. And one thing he did at a certain moment in time, <coughs> in, um, he put a um, heart monitor on, uh, on a player, on a boccia player. And for those familiar with the sport, you don't see too much activity on the field of play. You see two players or you see six players, depending on the format of the game. And uh, sometimes they wait very long for the ball to be released. You know, there's a little a white ball, the jack ball, and then you have a blue team and a red team and you try to get the ball as close to the jack ball and uh, the number of balls before the first opponent ball gives you the score. And so you play a series of games like that. Average heart rate over a game that lasts for three hours up to four hours turned out to be 153 beats per minute with a maximum of 180 beats per minute. And some would say the guy is not moving. He's sitting in that chair for four hours. When I saw these data, and they have been replicated afterwards, this became quite astonishing to me. This is the energy it takes for that athlete in a competitive environment, which, which obviously increases the heart rate by default a little bit, to just get the muscle coordination secured to target the ball and deliver the ball to the jack ball. If you don't know the sport and you don't know the severity of the impairment, you, you won't believe this, that this is, this is what's going on. And this is just indicative, and it's one of the challenges that we have with athletes with more severe coordination impairment. If this is what happens, and your heart rate is from somewhere between 120 and 180, which is maximum, how are you going to now do kind of a tailored training program that differentiates you for aerobic and anaerobic training, if this is your range? What does that mean if you have an average heart rate of 153 for a four hour 
competition with the athlete being there, not having access to his coach at that moment, not have a, has an assistant that may help him to win. It's quite a demanding thing. It was an eye-opener. The asterisk I put here on the, uh, on the reference, regretfully the data are not published. Yeah, so that means there is no paper in support of that one and you will see that asterisk coming in uh, a few times. This is some of the work that I've been doing before I was an academic. I was a wheelchair racing coach and um, there were some athletes, uh, CP athletes in, 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 my, in my neighborhood and they wanted to explore Petra running. Petra running is on a tricycle and uh, propulsion is not done by pedals or by cranks. It is foot propulsion that is either symmetrical, either asymmetrical, either even with one foot. So they can, they can do the propulsion. And they were seeking, and these data date from 2003, got published in 2010 by a student of mine. Um, we did a Cooper test. And we had access to nine individuals, which was the total Belgian population of CP uh, Petra cycling runners. And um, this is the 12-minute Cooper test. This is the distance that they covered per minute. And that's quite stable. So you would expect that they slow down on the distance covered by minute because of fatigue. It turned out not to be the case. Second observation, the heart rate from the very beginning was 170, quite submaximal. It was high all the way through. And the third observation is that when we took lactate after the third uh, or after the, yeah, the fourth, uh, uh, the eighth and the twelfth minute, within three minutes they were a lactic. The lactate threshold was already due to get trespassed. So, it raised a number of questions, and they are on the table tomorrow. Is this a sport that is good for those athletes? We were looking for a sport that complements boccia, boccia where there is no endurance-related component, but we were looking for a discipline where these guys could do something that really gave them kind of an endurance-related and active activity. And this is the only study done so far, to my knowledge. What about these data? Would this mean that this is a very efficient mode of propulsion? And we advised at that time that perhaps we might be better off to look into cycling, because then at least you have a closed muscle chain and your efficiency of propulsion will be higher. But it would bring a totally other can of questions, including like how to get on the bikes, how to ensure there is safety when you fall, how to ensure that you can go through the curbs because the center of gravity is high in combination with a certain speed, is it still safe? So there is value for that sport or that discipline to be considered. And they continued having some competitions, and about a year ago, Peter, yeah, they reached out again to IPC Athletics to seek for, um, is, it, is it for consideration to look into it? And the outcome of that invitation is that we are sitting around the table tomorrow also to discuss these data, but also to see whether there's other information that is not available for the moment being. Raul Rena is a um, coach, he's an academic in Spain, University of Madrid. He's also the head of classification for Football 7. And uh, in, in the time that CP Israel was governing it, they were dealing with both Boccia and with both uh, uh, Football 7. He looked at the Boccia, C, the, the BC1 class and the BC2 class. Both classes are athletes that can throw the ball with their hand, eventually with their foot, but they don't have a ramp, so they release the ball by, by locomotor function. Um, and uh, he looked into the electromechanical delay, and he found significant differences between the two classes. And that using as one of the explanations why you cannot just make one pool of athletes out of these, and you need to differentiate them. 
and put them in two pools. And he says the uh, electromechanical deficiency has to do with the stretch length that can be obtained and then consequently also the forces given on tendons and ligaments. And he said, depending on the stretch length you can have on an athlete, <coughs> to the extent it is not trainable, it may help you to allocate the right class to those athletes. So this might become a criteria for making two classes. So it's an onset to sports specificity and evidence-based thinking. The challenge we have in many of the Paralympic sports is, are we able to replicate this on a sufficiently large sample of athletes? And again, as an academic, my reasoning is quite interesting because I can say there is no exclusive data, more research is needed. And the sport governing body is say, what can you tell me? I need an answer. Hey, I have athletes waiting. Yeah? Again, you see, and I'm in between. When I'm meeting with academics, I'm the politician, and then I'm meeting with the sports, they come in, they say, you're the academic. So I'm always the wrong one. Yeah? Um, recent work, IPC has been funding now research institutes to drive our agenda forward. And the University of Queensland in Australia is one of the centers where we give a mandate. Um, and this is preliminary data. They were presented at our Congress in 2013, have not yet been published, but I know they're in the pipeline. They were looking at um, more sport-specific testing for coordination impairment. And that's of interest across sports, but they're mainly looking into athletics. And they found that mainly the um, dorsiflexion lunge that means if you stand in spreads, then I'm not going to replicate this with the risk of uh, so, uh, any discomforts, but the way, the amplitude you can have in this full position, that seems to have a significant correlation with your running time, particularly when you compare it with the stretch that able body can have. The same with your heel pull, so if you, the way you can pull up your heel. That seems to have a significant correlation with running time, and the relationships are different, able-bodied, and athletes with coordination impairment. Now, if this can be replicated over a sufficiently large number of athletes, again, this gives us access to some of the measures that we might need to consider when doing classification with those athletes. One of his colleagues looked into the relationship between coordination problems and um, throwing, so the standing throwing in the coordination classes. So they developed a series of tests. This is where you need to go with your hand in a box back and forth, yeah, which is a little bit what you also have as movement in javelin throwing. This is where you needed to pin boxes out and, and bring things, grasp function, yeah, which were all sport-specific, non-specific tests in terms of throwing, but related tests to what is the nature of activity that is required. They also did something with the foot where they had kind of a, a tap test, yeah, a plate tapping test with your feet. And it turned out that only at the box and block throwing, so the, 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 the placing of boxes and one thing, they turned out to have kind of a relationship with throwing performance at this moment in time. Again, they need to replicate it on a larger scale of athletes. So in 2014, this team from the University of Queensland, they had uh, access to over 100 coordination impaired athletes in Kenya. They had a partnership with Kenyatta University and they're now analyzing these data to drive that agenda forward and see what kind of nature is in there. But what they are developing is this kind of testing that you will not see in a physiotherapy testing uh, environment. So they're all much more sport related. And I think this is my final one. Uh, and keep that name in mind, Runkeman, Phoebe, Phoebe Runkeman. She's from um, Cape Town University uh, in South Africa. She's due to promote, um, hopefully in the course of the next week, there's a series of papers coming forward from her hand. She uh, had an interesting observation. She said, if I look at the power output and fatigue of uh, CP athletes, 
I can see that the power output is less compared to able-bodied, in this case runners and cyclists, but the fatigue profile is the same. And it was an observation as a coach that the fatigue profile of a CP runner was considered not being significantly different than the, than the fatigue profile of an able-bodied runner. And she found that in, in discongruence with the impairment profile. She said they should fatigue much earlier and the profile should be significantly different. And it turned out not to be the case. She's now looking into much more which muscles compensate, which muscles are affected, and she finds a significant disbalance between muscle parties involved in movement. And uh, keep that name in mind, there's much more work coming forward from her hand, uh, hopefully over the course of the next two, three months. So I'll, um, I'll stop here, but not without giving you um, a, a, what I think is still a very valid consideration. If van Landewijk was my mentor at university when I was there, 2003, and he said, if we want to drive the sport forward, we need to have a relationship and an interaction between trainer, coach, athlete, and scientist. The trainer and the coach, they need to look at performance and health-related parameters. And don't forget the health-related ones. Uh, some coaches tend to make an abstraction of these ones. The athlete should speak up about himself or herself to bring the right and the most relevant questions to the table. And then the scientists, they should find these answers to the questions that are very practical and pragmatic from those two parties. And I think, I think this is still a very valid consideration even when we are now 12 or 13 years later. So um, there's still much work to be done. I hope we can uh, give a little bit of a contribution to that one. Uh, as said, I went uh, in a snapshot on coordination impairment. There's much more stories to tell on Paralympic athletes, but I hope it was an introduction. So thank you very much. I found I found a form to the information flowing and how it could help with the payment of seated during the job. My only problem was they did it with able-bodied people. And I had a answering my dad. When the new rules came out, saying you don't let your phone. There were even rules about what people were proposing to do. You need to flow a certain way. Do you worry that now you're at risk? I'm not looking at the inner city of Ashley and the client to make the movement more like a body spot. Mm. I think you raise a very, very valid point here. Um, sport needs to be governed by certain rules. There's no question about it. Yeah? And in terms of throwing, we have standardized it and we say it must be seated throwing. That means throughout the whole cycle of your performance, there need to be a continued contact with your button and the surface. And that's, that's a standardization. However, 
if you look at, and I'm not familiar with the study you, you quote here, but if you look at seated throwing uh, across the different classes, and I'm not sure that they included club throwing in there, there's a study from uh, Frossar, uh, Laurent Frossar, who has been looking at um, 2004, 2006, 2008, and he tried to kind of come up with a taxonomy on the, on the modes of throwing in seated throwing. There is no certain model. It doesn't work. The, the reason why I talk about it, uh, I don't do it, but I think that when you play with the feet, you don't get warm up in the pain. Um, I just call where some people do. In the morning, at the top. Now, my worry is that with some people, for example, when they throw, they can't throw and stop the bum. Yeah. So my worry is, if you go too far ahead and look at how does it compare to able people, you're missing out the very fun impairment mm -hmm. which I'm May you are uh, at 31, at 32. Yeah. I think strapping is part of the solution, yeah? But I think, and, and while well, talking to some of the officials when I was out in Toronto for the Panam, Para Pan American Games over summer, is a lot has to do with the officials not being fully familiar with the athlete profiles, and there's much more work to be done in that regard. <laughs> Did I see a coach? Uh, the... I, was not, I was not off subject, so, uh, or, or shall I leave now? So, that is, the, 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 one of the problems and the challenges here is that also, and I, I alluded to officials training in the very beginning, we have a unique resource with all the officials in sport that make their services available. But we need to bring them to the particularities of the Paralympic athlete. And there is some room for improvement. I mean, yeah, there's a judgment that needs to be made, and I think we can standardize that even more than it is today. But point well taken, I'll transfer it to the sport. Please correct me if I'm wrong, because I can't actually remember it very well, but in the last Winter Olympics, I realized that, and Winter Olympics, um, I realized that in alpine skiing, for example, they were also, although they were all sort of they belonged to different classes, they still competed together, but there was a time adjustment. And I was wondering if that was, is that evidence-based or was that missed? I just wonder what it was based on, that was a... There's a formula behind it. Right. Yeah, so there's a statistician. So uh, we have two options. Either we run a separate medal event for every class, and then, again, we come down to how much value you get for the model. So in winter sports, we adopted that all the athletes in standing yeah, compete for one medal event. So now we have arm uh, impaired, we have leg impaired, we have combined impairments. In total, we have nine different classes, and they compete for one medal event. So what we have is we have all the race times over the course of a season and over the course of two seasons. Because your performance is always depending on the, kind, the type of snow, the weather conditions, the, uh, the, the slope design, the course setting. So there's so many variables that are in there. So um, everybody has a race time that can be calculated. And if your athlete population in every class is sufficiently big, you can generate kind of an, an average score of what is representative for that class. But you don't do that for one event, you do that over a series of events. So you get kind of a running average for every class. And there's a few classes where the 
um, where the athlete population is not that big, but then statistically you bring in a correction so that you kind of correct the data to ensure you have a minimal sample size. And then you see that if you now make a correction, if you take the fastest class as 100, you will see that all the other classes are a little bit different and slower compared to that one. So now you can use these reference data as kind of a correction formula. And what happens is that if you go to major events on screen, what you see running is effectively the corrected time. So if you would take a stopwatch and you would do the, the timing of that race, you will see that the result on screen might not be the same as your one. So they, this, okay, the, you, the, you can do that because everybody comes down one by one. Yeah. Yeah. You cannot do that in a 100 meter because the nature of sport is that the one who crosses the finish line first needs to be the winner. And that's where in the past when they started combining classes and then it took five minutes to calculate who the winner was, then you lose credibility. But in individual sports, you can do that. And that's effectively what happens in winter sport. And the formula is subject to change. Obviously, it's a consensus model, but there is a uh, mathematical model behind it. So it's not like. Well, I did, yeah, it's not like <laughs> You had a one end of your continuing continuum impairment on the other side healthy. I find those aren't the ends of continuum. Because mm -hmm. I don't think impairment you'd have a very healthy person who has an impairment. So I find I don't know if that's a helpful continuum. Mm -hmm. It's a very valid point. It's one that's easy for me to explain it where we are in the public perception on what is impairment. But impairment is, I mean, I am impaired in certain things and, and you are not impaired when it comes down to being, are you a runner? A thrower? Thrower. So you definitely are not impaired as a thrower because in your class you're unique and you're a high performing athlete. So I'll take, I'll take that comment. I'll challenge you, come up with a new terminology to put me there and I'll change my slide. Is computer simulation of human performance used to either try and adjust times, as Margarita said, or try and classify people, or try and model things? We are not yet at that point, but there is a paper out uh, in Nordic skiing already, which is uh, where mathematical modeling might, might become a, a future model. We're looking in data for swimming for the moment, so we have kind of a, a, a good series of data uh, and data points on able-bodied swimmers. And uh, I'm certainly not into, into that area, but when I talk to those people, they say, look, we can, we can draft a mathematical model on how someone behaves into the water, and then with new technology, we can then take out a non-functional muscle, or we take out the lip segment that is missing, and then the system yeah, then replicates what it should be. And I think there is certainly opportunities there. Uh, in surgery, it's done, CP surgery, yeah, for gait analysis, a lot of uh, simulations are done uh, before surgery is taking place on what is the anticipated outcome is done through, through mathematical modeling. That, that was exactly because there were papers presented. Yeah. There, but there was no papers presented. Not yet. I think this is why we might go to. The problem is the, um, a sports environment is not a fast-changing environment. So for the moment, uh, uh, classification is done by means of an on-site kind of an assessment of an individual. And when I introduced as part of the code review that over time we may need to go to laboratory scenarios to, to simulate activity and do classification that way, people were watching me and say, there's the academic talking, get out of my way. But I, I, I strongly believe that there is, there is uh, opportunities there to be looked at, yeah. Okay. yeah. One more, I think we've got time for one more. Yeah. Um,
in the place that we need it. But do you think that we should promote more disability specific events for those athletes with similar conditions rather than you need to work every four years for a big competition with my belief you be behind. It cannot be that um, Paralympic athletes have only one major event every four years and that they only attract 80,000 people like in uh, London Stadium every four years. When we, so after the London Games, which were an incredible success across all the sports, we went to all the federations and we said, what's your agenda to replicate this? And some had no agenda. <laughs> And some do have an agenda. Yeah? But I think we need to be very realistic. When um, there was an anniversary games last uh, July, end of July, it was the day after, I think, a Diamond League in London. Yeah? There was another uh, event. And we got 20,000 spectators into the London Olympic Stadium for a para athletics day. And the, uh, some of the athletes, some, the athletes were in the news and they said that the event was not promoted in full because there was only 20,000 people. I think we need to be very realistic. If you can mobilize 20,000 people, you, you do a hell of a good job. You know what the problem is? The stadium was still three quarters empty because it, it's that massive. Yeah? That is where the, the, there's a proportionality we need to look into. And some sports are really, really moving their agenda forward and some sports are really challenging. For me, and I'm now speaking, put off the, 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 the show there, as an individual, for me, it much goes with um, whether the Federation is uh, having uh, adequate resources to work with.